Hi, can um, I just get some person to say if they can hear me and then I'll get going. This is just a very, um, in the chat, if you just say that you hear me. Um, this is an impromptu chat. I really don't have, uh, I mean, I have a ton of news because I haven't gone live in forever. Um, so, but I'm going to use this as more of a, I'm just bored. And I was on both Judy and Society pa Pages live stream today and I just thought it would go live. So it's more of like a question talk thing. I, don't, I didn't make any graphics and I'm not going on camera. So let me see who I have here. It's just kind of like a hang, hang out. Hey, lady. Um, all shook up here in New Jersey. What a day. 30 miles from the epicenter. Yeah, that was big news. I mean, I'm from Los Angeles, so I'm used to earthquakes. But I know New York isn't. And it's funny, I actually was in an earthquake in New York. I don't know what year it was. Um, I don't know, like 2014, 2015, I have to look it up. But there was an earthquake in New York City. And I was working in an office building on Fifth Avenue, um, right across from the New York uh, Public Library. So really, it was like right across from um, Bryant Park. And uh, I was on the 13th floor, but they didn't call it 13th floor because that is bad luck in those office buildings. So they just didn't have a 13th floor. It's like on the 14th floor. And um, I was on the phone with a colleague because I was in the New York office and there was a DC office and, you know, there was other offices as well. Um, but I was on the phone with a DC colleague and the DC colleague said, oh my God, I think we just had an earthquake. And then I felt it. And so it, it literally moved up the line. Um, I forgot what year that was, but I ended up like having bouts of vertigo since then. And so that earthquake, because the building swayed and I never experienced anything like that, I started getting vertigo, like riding the subway. Um, and it was it was a direct result of that vertigo I got from the earthquake. Um, and I remember having to go and like do a bunch of tests and um, go to an ENT. In other words, tried to like induce my nausea, but it was all because of that dumb earthquake in New York. But it just blew my mind that I have been through an earthquake in New York. And then uh, I don't think it was that big. I thought it was a terror attack. And I actually grabbed my purse and I was like going to just like leave the building. Like I was like getting ready um, to get out of the building because I it was right by Grand Central. And I just thought it was a terrorist attack. And um, my boss at the time was like, looked at me and made I had there looked at me and, the, and he was like, chill out. Like that, like he put it like it's like it's gonna be okay. Like they really calm me down. And coincidentally, that's the same boss that um is uh cousins by marriage with Tim Jansen, which was a a huge shock to me when Tim Jansen dropped my old boss's name to me because he had figured out who I was. And um, yeah, they talked about me. So my old boss got to learn all this fancy fiction stuff. Literally, the dude that would approve my time cards each week that I would have to do, approve all my vacations, um, knew about fancy. It was like, uh, I still have not talked to him because I don't, I don't know how to address. I've talked to him once, but I called him from Tim Jansen's house. I was like, hey, um, but I worked very closely, but I, just, I was outed. It was so funny. Someone actually just outed me for the first time. They just sent me a a message. It was a friendly person that obviously follows me closely. And, um, but they sent me like a, a DM, like in the last couple of weeks, just like, I know who you are. And then they put my full name, like, oh, okay. This is the first time this has happened. And then they walked me through the steps of how they found me. It was actually quite impressive. So, um, that happened, but it was a friendly person. It was someone who actually came to the trial and I was riding in the elevator with them. And, um, they like turned to me and said, oh, hi, you know, I, I know you, I recognize your voice. I know who you are. And, um, Luckily, the person who found out who I was through the pretty impressive research, uh, picking up on things, um, was a friendly one and said, hey, you know, I saw you in the elevator. So anyway, two interesting things. Hi, Skeeter girl. Hi. Hi, Jean. Nettie, needy. Hi. Hey, Phoenix. Annie. Christine, Inglewood, Colorado. Yep. 
What's up? We got a fellow content creator here, Gersh, Wendy's TV. Go check out his channel. Maybe he'll be making some merch. Hi, hi. I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, we felt it in Connecticut. Ah, in Sparta, New Jersey. Yep. Hi, everyone. Hi, Debbie Martin. All right, so um, I guess stop. I'll try to shoot everyone up. Ask me questions and I'll respond. A five month countdown to December, se September 17th. I know, I think that's when jury selection starts, and it's really funny. Um, I think it's the 23rd. Um, it's the uh, September 3rd is when the actual trial starts, but it's really funny. A lot of people are actually coming. There's two lawyers that I know from New York who know who they are. Who are both like I'm, you know, they're making, they're booking travel, um, which is hilarious. One of them I can say is John Singer because I think he's announced that. Hopefully, he's coming. Someone that I've met, I've met John Singer. I drank alcohol with John Singer. He's very, very New York. Instantly, he you know, walk. He, he knows someone has that energy, kind of like the Josh Dubin. Oh my gosh, we can talk about Josh Dubin. I haven't talked about that. Oh, there's Society page. Hi. Hey. Um, yeah, the vertigo did go away, um, but um, it was very. It was just. It was just only because I was in a high building that I, I felt it so prominently. But um, it was really funny when I quit. I guess I quit New York. When I left New York, I literally quit my job after you know so many years, um, and I gave up my apartment, sold all my stuff, and I actually got on a plane and I went to New Zealand. I could have actually seen our buddy, the YouTube content creator. I changed his name. I don't know what his, what his name is. The one who was defaming um, Jeff Lacasse. And um, calling for saying that he thought that Robert Adelson should be charged in this conspiracy. Like anyone can really just take a YouTube, get clicks. They either like take public trial um, footage or some sort of tangential relative, you know, public footage like the grandparents bill legislation, stuff like that. And then they clean it up a little bit in Premiere Pro, which it's not, it's like they put in like fixed audio. The audio wasn't like bad. You're just trying to repurpose it so you can get clicks and views, even though you know nothing about this whole conspiracy, this murder of the players, you just realize that you can start a YouTube channel and just start talking your ass off. And because so many people are interested and the interest is already built and the fanfare is kind of already there, they just kind of like swoop in, whip their dick out, start talking a bunch of shit. And they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Pardon the French, but it's hard to watch just because I've been following so closely, almost like as an interactive case study academically, like reading everything I can. I mean, it's like, I've gone pretty extreme about this, um, you know, I wish I could say everything that I knew and everyone that I talked to, but it's like I really have ingrained myself and it's just out of pure skill and interest. So it's very frustrating. You know, there is a sense of me where I'm just, you know, it's like I it's the ego. I would be lying to you if I said it didn't bother me seeing, you know, people come in and kind of like take ownership and not address important, you know, I'm just, I'm picky. I'm picky about it. It's like when I watch these datelines or these 2020s, it's like, I realize that I get angry and sensed by what they're not showing and how it's just sort of like a one size fits all kind of like storytelling experience, but it's really not. This is a, anyone who follows this case knows how intricate all the details are, how complicated it is and how one thing may look one way, but you know, it's really not because it's smart people with a lot of money that planned a complicated murder over the course of many years that are doing everything they can to, you know, to stop being caught for it. So it's just, I don't know. It's very frustrating to see people, um, I'm not above saying it, sort of come in and uh, wanting to talk about something that has a lot of interest, but not really knowing what they're talking about. And it's just, I don't know. It's frustrating. And these datelines in 2020s, I actually told Ruth this. I was like, I think it was we talked after the first, the last dateline or whatever, about and I said I told her I was like if Walter Cronkite covered 
this case and did an, an episode. Um, Walter Cronkite did this and he had a good night. I would probably still be upset with how they, they they covered this. You know, it's just, I don't know. It's personal. It's personal for me. It's coming good. I've got the outlines. It's just, it's a lot. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. It's nothing that's going to, um, they're not going to be live streams. I'm having, I'm doing a lot of freaking graphics. I'm re-pulling up a lot of evidence. Um, it's a lot of video work. It's going to be detailed. And I see everybody who on, you know, all these, you know, reddits and everything where everyone's like, where's a good place to start? And I see that there's a lot of people that have come and covered this case and some they've done great work. It's not, I mean, you know, it's, it's good. I've seen some where I'm like, wow, this is really put together well. Um, but uh, they're reading cliff notes, right? So they're reading articles and they're like doing times and they're putting things together and they're seeing things from different insights or whatever, but they, um, very few people actually kind of have their fingers on the, the heartbeat, the pulse, and particularly with the people, and um, that the risk of sounding conceited, I'm in a position to do that. But, you know, and that just takes time because I obviously want to, um, I want to do right by the people that I'm essentially doing it for. Let's see what else going back to the comments. How do you know the personal details about Wendy and the lack of breastfeeding? That's so telling about how much she lies. Yeah, I would have to go back and, and relook this, but um, there's very few people that I haven't talked to just because I've been doing this since 2016. You got to think about how many years this is. There's been like putting out graphics and you know, um, even back in the day, if you go to Web Sleuths, like 2016 to wherever, you know, I was this person really busy and I really was driving a lot of the chat on the Web Sleuths back in, back in those days. There's no other place to go. Um, so just by doing that, I've just made a lot of, um, I don't know, I've just built a lot of trust. And so a lot of this is what people tell me. And Wendy had trouble breastfeeding. Um, and I've, I've dropped a couple things of, you know, who I've talked to and we know, we know that Tamara was called over to kind of help with Wendy with breastfeeding. She called a couple of her friends cause she was having trouble with the babies latching on. So she pumped. So that's why that, you know, I was breastfeeding in the Opa Lumpka, whatever. And that's why my parents came and picked me up. Um, no, she was pumping. <laughs> so there was no situation anywhere remotely in those last like two or three years where, you know, she would need to have a baby latched onto her breast while she's entertaining another. Well, it's fair that, that she could have been pumping, um, but that's something that you can plan for. <laughs> and on a road trip, you wouldn't, you know, unless, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I've never breastfed, but uh, after she said that, I had a, a couple conversations with people that kind of called bullshit. Um, Another thing that's a real bullshit. See, there's other things too, is I know so much, but I got to also too have to be quiet because I got to save some of this stuff for, um, you know, f you know, so that I have something to give in a larger body of work. Um, and also too, it's um, once I put something out there and I love the community, this is not a diss at all. Like there's so many people I'm just so grateful that are here and putting out stuff. So it's nothing like that. But like the minute I do put something out, it's news, right? Like the Harvey getting sued a few months ago, the minute I put it out there, it's all of a sudden it's, it's discussed, it's out there. And I don't really, um, you know, but that's, I, that's something to share, but there's like things like that, that, um, that I just, I, I know. Um, and that, it's also hard because this is ongoing, right? A lot of people don't want to talk publicly, right? Um, but there's all sorts of things. Like there's something I'll get into with um, along the lines of the breastfeeding. There's something with uh, Wendy, again, I'm, I'm someone, I'm not Wendy, you know, I didn't date Wendy. I was not good friends with Wendy. Um, I just, I know people that do know her and have told me things. So I just want to sort of say this, it's like, I'm not coming from a firsthand, but, um, 
I've heard from three people. A lot of times, too, if you hear something twice, once you kind of like whatever, you hear something twice, uh, it gives a little bit of weight. And when I hear it three times from three separate sources, I know something's up. Um, and it really shouldn't surprise anybody. But um, Wendy had the habit of telling people that she got into Harvard and Yale. She just tells people that. I think she tells them privately. She told someone that she was dating a male. And I, I, I feel good about telling this. I can't, just can't tell you how, but I, you know, if you trust me, trust me. Um, I'm asking you to. Someone told me firsthand um, that Wendy told them that she got into free. Well, okay. Let me take it back. Sorry. Ruth told me, okay, Ruth told me, um, and it's in her book, so that's why I decided to kind of share this source, but Ruth told me personally, um, and she alluded to this in a book about how um, Wendy went to Danny and said, you know, I feel kind of insecure. I don't want a lot of Harvard talk at this, um, at the wedding, I don't, you know, and Ruth wrote in a book, there was a lot of toast for um, Wendy, but none for Danny. And, and Ruth told me personally, too, about how Danny came to them. Um, and it was something about the drive. Like, she, it just it, like she really they were very surprised. Going to Harvard was obviously such a big part of um, Dan Markell. So for, not to be addressed, but he, you know, Ruth told me it even goes further than what she put in her book is that, um, you know, she really Wendy really did a number and like Harvard couldn't even be mentioned. And he told all his friends and it like really was on a lockdown thing. So, um, but Ruth told me that Danny told her, her son told her that Wendy claimed to Danny, her husband, that she got into Yale Law, but she didn't want to go. And she didn't go because she wanted to be close to home, University of Miami Law, because her dad was really ill and her parents couldn't afford it and didn't want to put the, the financial pressures and that's building on like the the dad losing the money in the Ponzi scheme. So when he's going to law school, when does she graduate? She's in her, she's a little bit older than me, but she's um in my in my age bracket. Mm -hmm. But so she's say 2004, 2005 is ish, probably is when she went to law school. Cause I knew she went, she got it like a year. And going going to Cambridge for a year. It's like um I went to a lot of people that went over to those English schools and the master's programs are really kind of, kind of quick. Um, so she was over there for probably like a year. Um, got that. So I would say, so 25. So Harvey's, she said she was in eighth grade when her dad lost all that money. So they've been rebuilding, you know, um, this must be in around the time where Charlie built, bought the pro practice from Harvey. Right. So it's like, not like they were really hurting for, for money. And you think they wouldn't send Wendy to Yale or Harvard if she got in the golden child? You think they wouldn't make, when Donna wouldn't move hell and, you know, move the earth to get her little baby in, you know, Yale or Harvard law. Are you kidding me? Um, so anyway, she told Danny she got into Yale, but then she refused. She didn't want to put the financial burden and wanted to be close to home because of her father's health issues. And we know that um, acoustic neuroma was in 1999. It was just a tumor. It was benign. No, no chemo, you know, even though she said on that podcast that her brain cancer surviving father is a way to enlist sympathy, make herself feel important. It's just, it's like Jeff LaCasse said, she's um, the ease to which she lies is like really disturbing. Um, so that's one of those lies is that she um, got into Yale law. And obviously it's a way to kind of, it's an ego thing, right? So then I heard from another source and I can't say who, but it's credible. The person's credible that she told she told a like a boyfriend of hers in the past that she got into Harvard. I don't know if this was undergrad or whatever, um, but she decided not to go because it was too expensive. And then she told someone else, another source, um, that I believe it was Harvard, that she got into Harvard, but she ripped it up, the letter, acceptance letter up, and didn't even tell her. Um, and didn't tell her parents because she knew they couldn't afford it. This three separate things. So part of me, I sat back and I thought over time, like, why is she doing this? Obviously, 
she's trying to tell people she got into these prestigious, prestigious schools. And I think a lot of it's her ego, maybe because she didn't, right? She's trying to keep up, you know, um, some level of prestige that she doesn't have, um, as maybe as people have, you know, tagged her as a narcissist, given some of the behavior that we've seen. So, I mean, that, that tracks, but, um, it made me really stop and think in addition to maybe the insecurity of all the Harvard talk at the wedding and why that was the kibosh was put on, you couldn't bring Harvard because it made Wendy insecure, um, per Bruce book. Um, but part of me thinks that she probably put that, put the lockdown on the Harvard talk is because she had told people, all her friends were there. I'm telling you three people, right, that have come to me and have told me that she had claimed that she gotten into these schools, prestigious Harvard and Yale that she didn't get into. It was only those two. I did hear those two specifically. So part of me thinks that if all of her friends are sitting around, you know, immersed with Dan's friends, and they're talking about Harvey, uh, Harvard and, and, and Yale, you think one of our friends would be like, yeah, well, Wendy got into Harvard. Wendy told me she got into Harvard. Oh, yeah, Wendy got into Yale. Makes me think she might have actually used that a little bit and wasn't planning on everyone coming into the room. And hence, that's why there was also an insecurity that she would kind of, you know, get people talking about what Ivy League schools Wendy did or didn't get into. I don't know. But just to hear that three separate times, credibly, one from the victim's mom, I mean, it's in her book. Um, well, I don't know if it's if Ruth wrote that Wendy told Dan she got into Yale Law and decided not to go because it was too much of a financial burden on her family and too far away. Um, but Ruth told me that Dan told her that personally. Someone else very credible told me that um, she got into Harvard. She told this man that she got into Harvard and um, ripped the letter up because she didn't think her parents could afford it and even want them to know the acceptance letter. And then the third source was another person who came to me said that one, one of Wendy's access is in communication with them. And that person told no Wendy claimed that she got into Harvard. So it's just very weird. I hear it three different ways and it just got me thinking, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, also too, you think Donna would not, I mean, Donna was so incensed that Wendy was sitting on the bench in Tallahassee, you know, just squandering away, like, you know, you know, Donna thought that she was like Michael Jordan, you know, like the, you know, and she was just sitting there all, you know, hands tied at, you know, she had medical mal malpractice sort of partner track multi-million dollar job track offer um, that she attached to her relocation, but she's sitting up being like a, essentially a lecturer, um, not tenured professor. So it just makes me think, well, if Donna's going to kill so that, so that Wendy can live the life, the best life she has, murder, you think Donna's not going to, and they had the money, they can, you know, they would have figured out a way. They would have sold their Coral Springs house if it came to it. So they had the money by that point. This this is something stinks about that. Uh yeah, possibly. Yeah, I do. And here's why is because that Wendy always makes a point to um have a recent meeting so that um in the trial she can refer to it. Um and again, it was like the day the grandparents legislation passed the same day. It was like hours. That's how symbolic it was. I think a lot of people, this gets lost same day, or maybe it was the day after, but it was within 24 hours. Um, Wendy reached out about scheduling a visit unprompted as a response, only as a response to that grandparents legislation passing almost in no one, you know, really talks about it unanimously. Almost. I think it was one or two. Someone voted against it, which was a, some douchebag, Michael Greco, who is just, layers and layers of ethics problems. You can go look at him. He recently was running for the mayor of Miami Beach and he left his gun in a backpack like on a playground. Someone found it, turned it into police, but he's all about gun safety. Just real scumbags. Um, and uh, and some people have reached out to me about Michael Greco on the side um, and I called him out 
I'll post or something, but um, just riddled with, you know, ethics and moral things. But anyway, he lives in Wendy's building. And so he was one of the people as a state rep to um, vote against it, which was, which was noticed. Um, but yeah, they always do reach out. I talked to Ruth not too long ago, last week, for, for a long time. And um, yeah, sure. They've, they've had some visits, but it's, it's limited. It's always under their control. A couple times in a yogurt shop. I think the last time the boys were allowed to sit kind of alone and off and away with Ruth. And that was kind of a, a bit of a, um, a milestone, something different. But it's weird, right? You know, have you heard Donna talk to Charlie on those and give sort of the account to Charlie on those jailhouse calls of, you know, what the boys said or what the meetings were like? I mean, you think that those boys are conditioned to have an open heart and warm feelings toward the Markells? It's incredibly awkward. I'm sure she does speak Spanish. I haven't heard it, but yeah. Cambridge, New Haven stops on the way to civilization. And I, you know, I've said, I think I've said this before as, you know, I, I, um, I went to Florida State and a little bit of high school in Tallahassee. And the minute that I could move away, I did because I'm just, I wanted bigger things. So in a way, I I, I get Wendy's angst um, of wanting to get out. And the first thing people, a lot of people say about Tallahassee, and I've heard it from living there, is it's a great place to raise a family. And that's very true. It's very beautiful. The schools are good. Um, there is some crime, but it's mostly segregated you know, to like the south part of town, which is what made the um, shooting in Benton Hills in broad daylight such a um, such a terror for the town. It was like a really violent murder and just like a safe little neighborhood. That's another thing that Adelson's really selfishly did is they terrorized a whole town for Wendy. For that little um, piece of shit that gets up on the stand and lies through her teeth all while holding her bar card smiling. It's really, it's a lot to take. Um, but anyway, back to this. I can understand wanting to leave a small town if you're not wanting to live that way. But she was raising children. She could have done it. If I had a small little family, it would be fine for a town like that. And I've talked a lot about Ruth about this. The big central theme is that Dan lived all over. He lived internationally. He lived all over huge cities, D.C. Um, he lived in New York. I I think he lived in California. I don't know. Israel, you know, all over. He's lived in major cities and he really did love Tallahassee. Ruth was telling me how excited she was, how excited Dan was when he called Ruth to tell her that Tallahassee was getting a Trader Joe's. Right. And I also remember being in New York and my mom telling me how excited she was that Tallahassee was getting a Trader Joe's. It's just, I don't know. Also, too, if you want to raise a family and you want to break, it's like why people have country homes that live in New York and big cities because they want to get away from that. And maybe at this point in life, Dan just weren't really wanted to get a, wanted to do that, wanted to live that type of life. Or Wendy, she just graduated law school. She probably wanted to go to a city and, you know, I don't know, spread her wings, have all these experiences, talk to like be international. She seems like a very internationally um, mindset person. So it just, it makes sense to me um, why she would want to bolt. But um, to the extent that the lengths that her and her family did to achieve that was unnecessary. Any human who still remains friends with Wendy and supports her in any way is revolting. Wendy belongs behind bars. Yeah, there was a couple friends. Um, I'm told there was one friend very close to Wendy. And I don't want to say the name, but... Um, like grew up with her. And I think Donna referred to this, this girl as like her second daughter. And um, after the Dateline episode, much like Robert, like with the first true crime special that people watched, um, they watched it and, you know, kind of went for answers and um, to try to talk to their family and friends. So um, I think Rob did that and just did not, the family just would not talk 
anyone that would bring up is stupid to believe it. They just shut it all down, right? It's much like how Rob said that when he talked to his mom first after the murder, and he's like, Mom, someone killed, you know, you know, Dan. Um, and she was just like, Oh, gotta go. You know, you know, it's just they don't, right? Like nothing to do with me. Rob said in that podcast, nothing to do with me. We don't want to talk about it. And Wendy was like, told uh, the first time she talked to Rob, Rob said that the, the exact phrase was, well, you know, Dan, he had no shortage of enemies. That's what she said in relation to who could have killed Dan. But meanwhile, just a day or two earlier when she's sitting in that police interrogation, when Isom asked her the same question, as just after he told her that Dan is you know, essentially going to die, he's brain dead, she says... I don't know who would do this. Nobody, you know, Jane was there. Nobody doesn't like him. You know, they just maybe don't want to be his lunch buddy in Ivory Tower, but no one hates him. He has no vices. So for me, I know it's so, it's not uh, direct. It's not direct. It's, as Tara Kloss would say. But um, just on a human level, that is so fucking telling to me. And I feel like, you know, maybe I should do that. Um, is that I'll put in because it's such a meaningful moment for me. It's really, everyone has their own little moment or like, ah, you know, it's an eye opening moment is that it really is Wendy in that interrogation, giving the narrative of like, he's not a, no one would want to kill him. She's like, well, you know, me, I, you know, it was me money, but um, he went from being, and even Jane, who was clearly enjoying, I don't, I hope Jane's listening to this shame on you, Jane. You are a disgrace in that interrogation. Wendy used you and rolled you up for all to see. And everyone's going to remember what a little sucker, what a little plant you were. She went out and walked with you when she had laryngitis, supposedly. Probably told you all the crazy things that she, you know, you needed to hear so that you thought Jeff was kind of off the chain. Someone to, someone to Wendy should worry about. That's probably what that walk left Jane thinking like, wow, Jeff. He's a real, mm. so Jane leaves with that impression. So if she's called in, of course, one thing, you know, Wendy is setting the scene, guys, setting the scene. She's too smart. This is planned. So, um, you know, to have Jane there and even Jane, who was so conditioned to, to you know, for Wendy, Wendy conditioned her. Um, even she said, she made a point to tell Ice, I'm like, he is loved especially in the Jewish community, like here are people that love him. He, you know, he's, he's a big deal. You know, he's a lot of people were like, he's an asshole. You know, I think he's an asshole to Wendy. I don't want you to marry, you know, but, um, and then Wendy agrees, like no one would want to kill him. He's like a dick because he's kind of, he's smart. You know, he probably just doesn't want to waste a lot of time doing the small talk, which I totally understand. And of course I get that, you know, from even on YouTube, the way I talk, I'll get, I'll get nasty comments somehow. So, I mean, you're just going to get it no matter what. And he's smart. And I just, I get that. You know what I mean? I can deal with that. I can deal with a dickhead. Someone saying a dickhead, sort of unthoughtful, kind of matter of fact things. I'll take that any day over some that like sick, sweet, um, you know, lying to your, you can tell it's like not genuine, not authentic. At least I can trust that, you know, I can't trust that. And as a, as a young woman who went through puberty in Birmingham, Alabama, around all that Southern sweetness, you know, you know, it's just, you know, very bad. It just, it was a very kind of like stab your back. There is like that, that it's just a thing. If you live in this you know, deep South, you would, you would get it. But, um, that kind of like, I like your dress and turn around like, Oh, her dress is so, you know, so trust me there. It's, it's, it's a cultural thing, especially in the South. So there's something about that. And I, my parents were Northerners. So I like go home and I didn't have that. I had a very direct, um, that culture. So when I, um, when I see people like Wendy, I can tell her just like, you know, the way she chuckles after anything might be a little bit uncomfortable for her. Like even when she's talking about, um, Dave Attell and Hey Dave, if you're listening, um, but, um, when she's talking about, she's like, everyone loves Dave. <laughs> You know, she does does this very uncomfortable. It's a it's a tell of hers when she knows it's not looking good. It's like a suit, sick, suit, like cutie patootie thing um, that I see through. Um, that's super like sweet. I don't know. It's just something that's so disingenuous, and I would I hate that. I really hate that. I just don't have a lot of patience for that. So if I were to run into that, I would be people. I'd be a dick too, but no one would kill me. 
Um, and I don't necessarily love how Dan used the court system to kind of stick it to Wendy. I, you, you know, there's a lot of things he should have just let go. Um, so, you know, nobody's perfect. Um, but, um, you know, I, I guess that's maybe the same reason why um, something that rubs me terribly wrong about Tar Tara Kawas, um, amongst other things. Um, but as I can tell how disingenuous she is. Like, she came out that gag and she was, you know, said, the media are like my family. There's just something, you know, in the hallway interviews. There's just something. I don't think she knows it. I don't think um, her law partner knows it. I, I don't I think you I don't think you can be that object. I don't think her little circle of um lawyer friends in Miami and her little 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 hub know it. Um but like I would never choose a lawyer like that. And I found it to be a, a, a huge turnoff to me personally. Um nothing to do with legally, just presentation stuff. I just really don't like that. I don't like that. It's just disingenuous. You can just I just don't think people realize how fake they come off. Um, Wendy has that naturally for me. Tara Kawas has that aspect. Um, I don't know. It's annoying. Just be straight. If you're a dick, call me a dick like Dan Markell. Call me. I would take that any day over the alternative of what I just explained. But anyway, that tell, that side by side of Wendy and interrogation saying, Nobody hates him. He's loved, you know, people just think he might be a dick, don't want to be friends with him, but nobody would do this to the fact she's talking to her own brother, the narratives, which is real freaking quick. That 180 is just so telling to me where she tells her brother, well, Dan had no shortage of enemies. What a, we are talking about someone who you slept with side by side for like seven, eight years, someone who you um, merged your DNA with and had two kids. To go from nobody would do this. He's not hated. He's not. He's not murderable. To within twenty four hours to someone different, a new face, a new narrative. Anyone could have done this. He's very. He's very murderable. That is so telling to me. I'm sorry. I'm missing all these comments. Hey, Judy. Let me see here. Yeah, Jan was proud. She spoke Spanish and called her Osita. And I'm going to do this too. I have um, some evidence, and I've done it some live streams behind my Patreon. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you that Dan wrote read her book. You know, um, two people of Dan's friends have come up to Ruth and said he told us he read the book. And I actually have some evidence of that, and I've shared it before. But I'm going to rework it and do it again. Yeah, because the, the optics were so, when, uh, Jared says, Wendy always arranges a visit before she is in court so she can say in court that they just saw them. Yes, um, she she did that right before. Um, the optics were so bad on that 2019 trial um, for her. It made her look really bad. So by the 2022 trial, she arranged something right before um, so that she could say they did. I mean, it was very calculated. I talked to Ruth. Ruth took it. Ruth didn't care. And then, so then they were invited to the bar mitzvah because Wendy knew she was going to have to be testified. And the optics were horrible and she did not fare well last time. I mean, they're passing grandparents, symbolic grandparents, right? Legislation in the state, a whole state law. Lawmakers came together on both sides, Democratic and Republican in Florida. That's a terribly divided um, state house. And they came and voted for this because Wendy's such a horrible person. So of course she's doing things to mitigate that. And one of the things was this visit right before the, the May, 2022 trial. So she, it was late April. Right. And so, and Wendy was just going to invite them to the bar mitzvah, but Ruth said, look, if we're going to be down, can we do a visit beforehand? Cause we don't want to come to such a mate. We're going to be strange. Well, we want a little one-on-one. -on -one. This is like a significant to walk into like a, our misfit of parties terribly, you know, we want to just see that we want to see our grandkids, like really see them. So that's when they met at the yogurt shop. And Wendy always brings the same um, father, like a friend of a father of one of the kids' friends. I actually know who it is. 
Um, and um, another thing I'd like to point out too, while I'm on this and men around Wendy, supporting Wendy, I don't know who started this rumor. I've tried to clear it up a little bit online. I don't know who the hell starting this lawyer. This is what's so sad is that Wendy in 2016, the time of the arrest worked for a man named Mike Fernandez, who's a billionaire and he's, um, he's Republican, but he's very into immigration and immigration issues and immigration rights. So that's when he hired Wendy to lead his little, little project, his little charity, his little investment fund that handled those. So anyway, so he wrote a letter because Wendy obviously went to her boss and said, hey, they're dateline coming about the murder of my ex-husband. I don't know what they're going to say. So he's the one. And it, it, clearly it was Wendy and her boss who drafted it or, or, or Lauro who drafted it because in it, he Mike Fernandez has a line in there that says something to the effect or very closely that um, prosecutors have rightly determined that Wendy had nothing to do with this murder. Go look, Mike Fernandez, you know, Wendy. And so how can he say that? Now she's labeled co-conspirator, but of course he's a rich billionaire. He's a rich guy with an ego, so he'll never apologize. I find that they rarely do. Much like Mike Mintz, the Mintz family, who's on the phone calls, mega, mega, mega wealthy. Um, and um, very, you know, always like litigious, always in lawsuits with people. And you heard him on the phone call right after Charlie's convicted. He's talking with Mike Mintz and um, Mike, well, you know how I seem to get out of these things. Mike Mintz also says something to the effect of, I told you what you should have done. You should have taken a vacation. He's talk basically said, I told you you should have, you know, got out of here. Um, so he's extremely wealthy. He'll never apologize. Like this Gary Cohen, this medical malpractice lawyer that I did a post about, very wealthy. Um, here he actually went to night school and was taken under the wing of um, a, another lawyer and trained. That's how he, he got to his prominent position, Gary Cohen. So he's kind of self-made, but um, very much sticking beside them. He was at the 70th birthday party, um, huddled up with the family during then. I, I was told actually, I want to confirm this through a second source, but in addition to writing the job offer, the lucrative job offer that Wendy attached as like um, as bait for her being able to move to Miami, um, he, you know, he also was consulted on the one million dollar, you know, bribe they took him and tried to work through if that could be a, like a, a legal deal with Dan. He was the one consulted on that. Um, but uh, I forgot my train of thought. But it was about Gary Cohen. Oh, I don't know. But even you hear in the 2016 wiretaps, Charlie's bragging at one point, he uses the phrase, it's like asking Gary Cohen to get me out of a parking ticket. And he was using it as an example of like, you know, you don't need to, you know, you don't need a jackhammer to, you know, create like a small little hole. You know, that kind of, that was the, the essence of what he was trying to say. But he was like bragging about him and the relationship. What else? Have we got? Oh, here's what I wanted to say. I heard that Gary Cohen actually traveled up to Tallahassee to attend the relocation hearing. And the relocation hearing was supposed to be like a little mini trial, right? So Dan and, you know, and uh, the Adelsons came up with Gary Cohen, probably to testify about the job offer. Like there are really, it was supposed to be like a mini trial. It was a real thing. But um, I believe Ruth told me this, so it's true. And um so, but they get up there to the, to have this relocation hearing on, on that motion. And it was like so quick. The judge just looked at it. I was like, no way. There's no grounds. Sorry that you want to move to Miami and have a better life. But uh, the, the law is the kids are happy here. This is their home. A parent, both parents are here. They stay. This is not a good enough reason that you want to live a better life, Wendy. So, um, or life, not even a better life, a life that more suits your needs at this point. Um, so, they all traveled up there and apparently they were devastated that it was like 15 minutes or 30 minutes. I don't know, but it was something to that effect where it was like so short. It wasn't a trial. It was shut down even before it started. And um, they were very upset, the Adelsons. But Gary Cohen was up in all that. So, And now he's handling this wage and hour dispute. It's overtime and whatever. Um, it's not his jam. So it just shows. And we also heard in the 2022 call about how Gary Cohen was, um, Harvey was looking and Charlie were talking about getting him added to the, the lawyer list of people that he can have private calls with. So it's just, 
there's a lot of really, you know, Tova Walsh who goes out and lectures the circuit and gets grants from the government to study the importance of fathership on a child's development um, is still supporting, you know, she still has her supporters. I think Dave Attell still believes in her and in her innocence, the, the, the famous Dave. I would love to ask him. Dave, reach out to me. I'll be nice. I think we got in a little fight on Twitter and I think he blocked me, but that was years ago. You know, I'm cool. I'm not, but I would love to know that Dave and I will be nice. I just, I'm generally curious. You know how to find me if you want, no pressure. Um, I'm totally lost on all these. Um, there's Katie Cool Lady, Roxanne. Hi. I'm sorry if I'm missing everybody. I'm just uh, shooting the shit here. Med, med medical malpractice. Which kind of, it would be, you know, when he did have like whatever, it's totally a different thing, but she, I mean, it does look good on the re resume to do that medical legal partnership. I mean, um, I could see that being a specialty for her. Tomorrow, tomorrow it, um, I've met her and I've spoken with her. Um, she's a very, she's got like eight degrees. She's like getting a, a master's or a bachelor's in nursing right now. And the little one I talked to everyone's in Tallahassee. She's amazing. And nursing. She's good. She went to Harvard Law with Dan. She's just like, she's a perpetual student. But um, she's one of those people. There's like certain women. And I have a couple of friends like this. I'm can be, but I'm most often not this woman. But there's some women that are just very calm, calming. You know what I mean? Like you get in front of them. You can just tell her. Like, like they're just very settle they'll say they don't get worked up too easily i've got a couple it's actually a nice yin and yang for me because a couple of my friends like they're just so soft they're instantly i don't know you just feel soothed in their presence by how they communicate and i don't know it's a very motherly nurturing thing she tamara has that and you know it's really funny the juxtaposition if you look at tamara's police interview the shock the sadness, the her reconciling, like genu genuinely, I know everyone reacts differently, um, but that's genuine. That was really genuine that she was in a lot of pain. I did not sense that genuineness from, from Wendy. Part of the reason I was telling Ruth this the other day is everybody like has their little reason of why they're into this case. There's a lawyer that listens that might listen. Um, you know, that it's hilarious to me how many lawyer people listen to me, considering I have no you know real legal background. I'm talking about something that's is legal. Um, but um, they, you know, someone told me like um, their own relationship with their narcissistic mother. Um, you know, obviously there's some things they then it's their feelings toward like, gosh, you know, they thought they had it bad, but then they look at Rob, uh, Robert Adelson, you know, and that's their little, you know, connect. Everyone has got their little issue of why this case is like sticks under their skin. And I was telling Ruth what it was for me is, um, and I told her, I told her this from the very beginning when we first started talking, I was like, I'm not doing this because I necessarily am seeking justice for the victim on, and I'm very honest about that. It's not, it's a truth seeking thing and it's genuine, but um, I'm not like doing this uh, so much for that. I'm just being honest. I'm doing it because I'm mad. I'm mad that this family, you know, the injustice of them getting away from it. And really what triggered me to really kind of dig in. And I don't know if it's my experiences with women, particularly, and I'm a woman. I don't know. Um, if Wendy just really reminds me of a few people in my life that I could read their tells and I have experience, but I knew Wendy was faking immediately. 
immediately. And I've said this before, it's like, I'm, I'm very susceptible to emotion, you know, instant bait, put a hearing aid in a baby that's never heard before. And they hear their mom's voice for the first time, that kind of stuff. I'm very moved by it. Sarah McLaughlin comes on and does that um, abuse animal commercial beside myself, you know, colorblind guy gets those glasses from his family and can identify all the colors in the balloons they're holding in front of him. All of that. It was the opposite reaction of that, that I had when I was watching Wendy's interrogation and just my gut instinct. I knew she was lying. And what made me so mad and what really made me like sink into this, put my teeth in is that I knew she was good enough that she was probably going to get away with it. And that, that, that is really, you know, if I'm being honest, that's my sticking point, you know, that's, that's what drives me right there is that that interrogation to me, I saw it. I knew she was lying. And of course, a lot of lies have been, you know, in there, you know, obviously I've learned a lot more and I've become even more steadfast um, in my belief that Wendy knew and was involved in the planning and whatnot. But, um, I saw it. I saw it, the fakeness. I saw what she was doing. I felt it. And I knew she was good enough at it. That she was going to get, get away with it. And maybe even that's a little bit of my own manipulation thing in me. You think I have, I've worked for, I've used things unfairly. I've, you know, I've done similar, you know, she's working it. And then maybe in ways I've used my own, you know, attributes or things that I have to work it too. And maybe manipulate a little bit and maybe, you know, so maybe I recognized it and I, you know, obviously this is much more severe. It's a murder or maybe I was just trying to get my way about something, but I like I just saw it. I knew it and I knew she was going to probably get away with it. And that's, I guess, with the fighter in me, that's what got me really into this case. Um, it even goes a little further with Tamara. She was not treated well by Wendy and Wendy's supporters at Dan's memorial. And I don't, I'm not gonna even get in any any more of it. Maybe I'll do it more in my podcast. Maybe I'll ask tomorrow if she'll speak with me. Maybe she will, maybe she won't. There's people like that that really want their privacy. Her and Shelly Markell, I think, are one of them, are kind of the same that way, both of whom I've talked to. All right. Anybody have any questions? It's almost an hour. I was just really just doing this to kind of check in. I felt kind of bad. Um, I haven't been, I needed a little break there for a while. Um, Needy says, um, it's fascinating because so many people involved in so many different personality types and any one of them could have stopped this from happening yet none of them did. Yeah. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think Donna and Charlie enjoyed, I think they enjoyed planning and carrying this out and getting away with it. Like as like a team, like the logistics of it. I think they really enjoyed it. You know, finding someone to murder Dan and the murder and that whole day it happening. I think it was very thrilling for them. Um, and I think Harvey was more cautious about it, uh, more scared, um, as I do believe Wendy as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, a whole family committing a murder for, I think there was a lot of reasons why they did it, but ultimately it was so that they would win, right? If you want to like put it in a um, bucket, I, they wanted to win. It's like Jeffrey Lacoste said, it's like their hobby was hating Danny. They wanted to win. They wanted to end this. I don't anymore. I don't anymore. I do think she's going to get arrested. I remember even being on Surviving the F Survivor when they first started out. And it was like, every question was like, when do you get arrested? Will Donna get arrested? And I came out and every all the lawyers were like, no, there's not enough. But I said, I'm going to go against the grain. And I'm going to say she is getting arrested. So I even remember back in the day, I was like the first, everyone was like, oh, they're not enough. Or they would. And I'm not saying they have enough right now. Maybe I'm just being hopefully optimistic that something, I mean, God for God knows what's on, on all these devices that they took from Donna's and Harvey's place. And I told you guys on a live stream before it was even reported 
that the FBI went in and went into Harvey's place and took things. And this was not reported anywhere, but I said it in the live stream and it was later reported. <laughs> they didn't took it, but also what's not reported is that um, when the FBI came in to Harvey and Donna's condo, Harvey happened to be talking to Charlie on the phone at the same time. So he got to hear the FBI coming in. So, but going back to, um, going back to, you see how Donna's texting Wendy, even the day after Charlie's conviction, when she's using lines, like, I bet you have a lot to think about, stuff like that. And when she used that line, everyone always looks to protect you. I bet you have a lot to think about. I think there might be a lot, of, like they're never going to text each other. So glad we got away with murdering Dan. Ha ha ha. LOL. There's not going to be anything like that. But, um, and they said they went all the way back to 2013. Right. And in some of those documents, the evidence that they could go back to, like there was a phone. So they had the old stuff lying around. I just don't think they're that technically savvy. I do know that Wendy's boyfriend right now, this is, I, I forgot to follow up on this. This is where I, I segued and never followed up. I remember now. But um, Wendy's boyfriend is in the IT sector. I know all about him. He's not uh, Mike Fernandez's um, son, which is what I never followed up on. So basically, Mike Fernandez had, Mike Fernandez came out and wrote a sticking up for his employee, Wendy. Mike Fernandez has a son named George. So everyone on the internet starts saying that Wendy's dating Mike Fernandez's son because the name is George. It's totally false. Um, I've seen the guy's picture. He has a couple kids. Um, he works in the IT sector, corporate. Um, looks like a normal office job. Yes, I've seen his LinkedIn. He's got some social media as well. So I leave him alone. Um, he's paying for it, whatever, you know, he's doing enough. If he's a nice person, he's getting duped um, to hell into high water. But anyway, it's not a billionaire's son. Just another wild internet rumor about this case. So anyway, going back to that, I think, yeah, I understand why they don't arrest Wendy. They kept her pretty clean. I don't want them to charge her and then not convict her. Um, I don't want them to swing and miss. But um, like, like, you know, all the delaying in Katie's trial just brought out a bunch of more horrible stuff for her. And, um, the, you know, redoing the Dulce Vita, finding Jessica Rodriguez, um, tightening up a lot of the holes, like clean, clearing, cleaning up. There's no way that she was making $1,500 a night at Club Hollywood Live, that kind of bullshit. So they really like, cleaned it up and it just made it worse. And she almost lost last time. She thought she would and she thought she was getting acquitted. What conversations are you having with your legal counsel that you're walking into that trial with all the evidence thinking you're getting acquitted? I understand that denial is very powerful. I understand that the last thing you want to do is admit that you're a murderer. But don't you think like that Dulce Vita revision, like who like the way they hammered her, that just made her, I mean, it was like, wow. And I don't know, not to rehash all of that, but the longer they delay things like this, it may seem like justice delayed, justice denied, but in a way it's, and I think I actually have to give Judy this point because I think she made this point a couple of times on the live streams and maybe that's why I'm regurgitating it. Um, I can like remember hearing her saying this and sticking with me is that, um, yeah, the delays, all this great stuff came out because of it. So I remember Judy making that point and just like double down on that. It's like, yeah, that's really stuck with me. Um, yeah, so if they're dating that IT guy, so when, um, so Roxanne says, wait, she's dating an IT guy. I wonder what he erased for them. I mean, you know, I'm next level, so I got a lot of information on this guy. I mean, I could totally, it was much like, oh, so one thing I want to talk about, I didn't really talk about the New Zealand guy, the Kaylee NZ. I have a lot of screenshots. I just don't want to, um, he's now like true crime reaction. He changed his name after I called him out, turned off all his comments and he's going out there and basically just taking a lot of trial footage. Um, he's not doing commentary anymore, but, um, yeah, he really, man, what a bad guy. Cause what he did is he's obviously talking out his ass. He's some idiot in New Zealand. 
there's like 40 people on that island. Honestly, I would go live in New Zealand. Um, I prefer the South Island. It's much more beautiful. I've done both. But uh, I love New Zealand. But it's very small. There's like 400 people. So this idiot gets on and um, he, I guess he does some Googling and he finds a, a Jeff Lacoste, um, like same age or so similar. It could be plausible. Um and so that he, and he looked up and saw that he had a domestic, this Jeff Lacoste had a domestic um, battery, a domestic violence charge in 2010. But what he fails to realize is there may be one more than one Jeff Lacoste. Unlike New Zealand, there's more than 400 people here. There's a lot of Jeff Lacosses. There's people that have my full name. It's like, and it's not that common. So this guy's just an idiot, but he kept going on. He was even writing in the comments, Jeff has a domestic violence abuse charge. And they, I was seeing in all these other like message boards because people were actually listening to this guy and believing him. Like they were like typing like, Jeff, Jeff is not a good guy. Check Jeff's past, check Jeff's past. And so he was going up and he was pulling up records assuming this was Jeff Lacoste. Well, guess what? I paid $40 and I did the real search and it's not him. And Jeff Lacoste's birth date is a matter of public record from all the files I have. You take that. It's not the same guy. Jeff wasn't even married. He got married in 2010, but he was not married at the time this charge was, you know, and he wasn't even living in Florida. He was in Arizona or wherever he was. It wasn't even a state. So this guy's just wrong. And he really ran with it. And then he started saying, attacking Robert Adelson in his commentary. So he'd watch all of this and like give an off the cuff reaction. He started saying how Robert was probably involved in the plot. And I, I have these screenshots where he's saying this. It's not as an opinion. He's saying it, it's like, it's horrible. So he's now true crime and reaction. He said, I bullied him. All I did was call him out and try to stop the lies. I understand that if he sees one name and it's Jeff Lacoste, that's like a big deal. That's a sure thing for someone that lives in New Zealand where there's 400 people. But there's a lot of Jeff Lacoste. It was the wrong birthday. Jeff didn't live in the place where this guy was charged. Jeff was not married at the time this other Jeff Lacoste struck his wife. It just was complete irresponsible. It caused a lot of pro problems with people in the comments saying Jeff was beating his wife. Just awful, awful. I mean, the guy's not been through enough. So anyway, this guy's now gone and he's changed to true crime and reaction or whatever. Um, and he's like repurposing videos. He's just like taking like trial footage or the Lauren Brock with the grandparents bill but me, you know what that's public video you just go find the day of the grandparents bill and you just go find it on the Senate, florida senate website it's not hard but people want things easy and he's putting up a lot of phone calls so what he's doing is taking the content of this case and he's basically like repurposing it in a way with these flashy thumbnails and he's making all money he's making money he's getting hits he's getting youtubes and i see people on reddit and even people that are like, I'm surprised that I've called out. They're like friends who I know are on the right side. I think sharing and stuff. It just goes to how icky, you know, this YouTube world really is. And part of the reason why I haven't been on is I really don't feel like I'm a YouTuber. It kind of sucks, honestly. If you're like really going to be authentic or say something that's kind of maybe supercharged. YouTube is for, I think, people that want to gear towards the middle. You know what I mean? Somebody's friend. You know, I get that. You want to listen to people. People like people that don't push buttons or don't cuss or don't, I don't know, don't say like or all the little filler words that I'm doing as a non-professional. It's really not that rewarding. I don't monetize my YouTube. I have my Patreon, but that's just, Patreon is just, I don't know. It's just a way to support me so that I, I don't know. It's also, to, it motivates me when people join that. I don't know. It's like a way to show support. I don't know. It's a weird thing, but I don't monetize this YouTube because I don't want ads to be run during wiretap calls and all that stuff. I don't know. I just don't like it. So the YouTube is I'm not making a thing, but these people, um, there's like, like this New Zealand guy, he's like, he's making a living and he's saying and doing really bad things about a case that I personally care about that the right things being said and there's no, um, not misleading it and that everything's everything straight. It's like personally, I want to keep everything honest. And so just dealing with people like that's really hard. Anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to go now, but, um, anybody, uh, want to ask me a, a, um, a question? I seriously don't think people realize, um, 
how plugged I'm in, how plugged in I am. So if there's a question and you want to know, just ask, ask me. And you see how I have these facts and details on the top of my head. So if you have something, ask me. I'm looking at the bottom. Otherwise, I'm going to go and um, happy Friday. Um, the New Zealand guy says, guy, he was branding himself as um, Kaylee, C-A-L-E-Y-N-Z TV. And so I called him out and just showed that he was like, Saying he was basically accusing, he was defaming Jeff Lacoste as a wife beater of all things. It's not, um, there's more than one Jeff Lacoste, and it it wasn't him. I proved it. And so I put that up. I paid 40 bucks for the official records and immediately came back and said, like, You didn't look at the rights. And he's like mansplaining to me all this. So when he went away and did a post about how he's getting online bullying, I don't even want to call attention, but I will tell you this he's grown and following he gained a couple thousand followers after i called him out for those horrible things and some people and i had to point it out like love katie coley she's my girl but because he changed his name she was sharing his videos of like that lauren brock you know he's just a bad guy doing bad things spreading lies about jeff lacasse as a wife beater people that care about this community are gonna fucking take that i'm gonna let him do that so they can make like 50 bucks a video or whatever YouTube pays you. I don't even know. But anyway, he turned all his comments off because what he was doing was horrible. And I, I pointed the light at him. But he's thriving and so, so disheartening. And I don't even want to, don't even want to bring it up or cause more attention. It just brings in more followers, but it just... He's almost got as many followers as me now. I'll put it in here. It's just sad. Yeah, I mean, he gets more hits than I get on videos. And I put my whole heart on this and don't monetize. It's this asshole. Put it in the chat. Um, Not a ton of updates on Wendy and Harvey. Uh. From what I know, Charlie's still in solitary, not talking to anybody. I mean, I know things I just can't say, basically. Um, I mean, Harvey's doing fine. He's dealing with this lawsuit with Gary. He's going through all of Charlie's things, trying to pay up all his debt. I do know that he's making the rounds. He's really trying to keep the trains on the tracks with like their business and um, paperwork and stuff like that. Uh, go Georgia. Yes. I'm going to try to be at the trial again. All my friends will be there. I was telling Jay who's here. Jay should come. Jay Harvey still waiting on that taxi. That poor man must have taken him. And also, too, what kills me, Donna acts like he can't like put one foot in front of the other. I know for a fact he's going and like doing things that like everyone wants to paint him as this old feeble guy. He's really not. And also, too, he's got a grown daughter that lives in the same city that can come get him. He's got a, a perfectly fine, you know. One, you know, one child, a child of, of three that's still left that can help care for him. But I've heard from very reliable sources that Wendy is a shit caretaker and she will not be taking care of Harvey. And that Harvey takes a lot of patience to deal with. And you can see how Don is managing him, even in that short little airport clip. He's very frustrating to deal with, is what I've heard. Tell us what you can say, LOL. Um, that's why I want people to ask me questions. Otherwise, I'm just like pulling it. But if someone wants to ask me a specific question, you might be surprised if I give you a very specific answer. Carl will be live tomorrow at noon central. Everyone, mark your calendars. 
Coke and hookers for Harvey. Ugh. Um, yes, yeah, so I was told um, through a source um, that the boys were doing task doing testing um, and that Wendy was telling a friend of hers that the um, like the boys were testing and they were looking into the schools. like I don't know if she applied or did anything but wendy was talking to someone about the route of putting these people putting um the boys in boarding school which there's like nothing wrong with it. their dad was a you know harvard guy and so to maybe go to some of these prestigious boarding schools um there's an option if you think about it it's actually i i want wendy to do it in a weird way mm -hmm. because it will isolate the boys and give them more of a you know, if they're off in a, you know, a boarding school, it's, it's its own little world. It might be a little more protective than a public school, TikTok, you know what I mean? Just the world is a little smaller, um, might be a little more safer and a little more um, cushioned for them, especially given the fact that they probably are so academically um, gifted, um, given their, their gene pool. I think that would actually be very good for them and to be away from all of this. Um, but the other thing that was pointed out that about the boarding school, so I can't tell you, I just know that it was being discussed. Someone told me like it was a route that Wendy was like considering. And um, the other thing that's pointed out that might be a very um, interesting way to look at it is I was just sort of like picking apart, you know, thinking about it is that God forbid Wendy is arrested. I mean, not God forbid, God, you know, hoping that she um, is held accountable for her role in this plot, and it can be proved in some way. Um, if the boys are in boarding school and they're happy, I think that that like maybe the courts and even the Markells or you know however the custody would work out. Um, if Wendy's not there to to have sole custody, um, it, you know probably be everyone might be inclined to sort of keep them there. Um, and so in a weird way, it might be a way for Wendy to think, well, if I do get arrested, at least I can ensure that they'll stay here and not go to the Markels. And that's just, I'm thinking about what, what advantages Wendy would get out of that, besides the fact of just taking away, which I hope it would be normal on its face, that she's just trying to give her kids the best path for them. Um, but given I know how she calculated she is, um, I just had to think about what the benefits might be for her for doing that. Um, especially the fact that like her family kills if she could have full custody, that only to send them away to boarding school would be weird. But um, I don't know. That's what I know. No, Harvey has not been labeled a co-conspirator, but he's always been listed on all the, the, um, He's always been listed on all like the charts of being involved. But he basically what you have to do is you have to commit an overt act or do something to further the conspiracy. And so far, I haven't really seen anything that would do that. Besides maybe if it could be proven that he went with Donna to go deliver the money somehow and knew and knew that he was delivering the money that could be proved. But um yeah, it's just if you just look how look how Donna wouldn't even let him trust him to go get out of the airport and get in a taxi. Like she was that concerned. So you can see the level of her doing everything else and therefore doing everything around this murder and making sure Harvey doesn't have to do anything. Um but uh I they definitely and I was gonna do thinking about this doing a little, maybe I'll save it. See, I gotta save all this, save some stuff, but um Right after the bump, um, Pat Sanford actually testifies to this. And I forgot which trial exactly, or it might have been all of them. But he testifies to the fact of that right after the bump, there was a poolside meeting with Harvey, Donna, and Charlie. And it was one of those conversations, much like outside Monty's, when it was just Harvey and Donna. The FBI, it was time, the FBI were like trying to catch them because it would have been a prime time that around when all of this stuff you know was happening so it, they, they were on it trying to catch the conversation because something had just happened a bump and i don't know if it was i can't remember exactly when it was it was when they like tickled the wire or all that but basically there was a poolside meeting that the fbi couldn't capture but they saw and it was harvey donna and charlie discussing 
um, and they just couldn't hear it. So Harvey very much was in those discussions. We heard him not very upset at Mitsuri if he really was kept out of it. And he really was told about the plot. And he really did sort of whisper that he got, Charlie didn't whisper that he got extorted in his ear there at, at Mitsuri. Harvey wasn't acting upset. Harvey was acting clued in. Harvey was saying things like, is that what Katie told you? Very calm. So that lets me know that he, you know, it's not acting like someone who was kept out of it in a surprise. And then there was, you know, when Charlie was summoning Katie over to the icon, trying to get her to drive down to Miami Beach to go meet them because he was talking to his parents outside um, about the bump. And she kind of refused because it was too far. So they ended up kind of meeting halfway. But in that call, he said, I'm talking to my parents about everything. And he was referring to the fact that like he was cluing them into this bump. And everything. so Harvey is very much in, I mean, Harvey's, you know, Emails that Donna would send, they were from Harvey and Donna. They're very much one in the same. They run a business together. They sleep in the same bed. So the fact that somebody thinks that Harvey's just off in the corner and kept out of all his family that he's very close with like this is, is ridiculous. And then we know he couldn't look Tamara in the eye. It gave like a very weird vibe, like a guilty vibe after he like really set the the hair up on the back of Tamara's neck. You got to listen to that gut feeling. She knows them. So there was all sorts of things. And then just Harvey's not, Harvey wanted to beat up that guy that Charlie accused of sexually harassment because he called Charlie on not doing his work in Perio school. Apparently there was another instance back in the day where Don and Charlie went to high school and Charlie maybe accused one, a teacher at high school about sexually harassing him. This is their little thing. They're little scams. Awful, awful people. Um, they won't show it to you right away, but uh, you know, you peel back the onion, you start seeing things. So. Harvey, not officially labeled, but he's he's everywhere he should be if he knew. He's in all the conversations. He's around all the people. I'm sorry I don't have, you know, the state doesn't have him, you know, texting Donna. So glad we murdered Dan Markell, you know. It's just tricky. Um, she testified to the fact that um, her LinkedIn is back up just very recently. Um, and she was at that, if you follow me on um, Patreon, and I think also put it on Instagram in my stories. Um, a couple of weeks ago, she was uh, Miami, the Coke Scholars, um, had a Miami little session. And she was right there networking um, at the Miami Coke Scholars um, sort of networking event. So had a little name tag on, smiling front and center. Not a problem. It's not a problem for Coca-Cola uh, Scholars Foundation, that's for sure. Um, and then it was like last fall. Um, last fall, uh, either right before or right after the trial, I think right before. She was in Atlanta, the, the their annual conference the Co at the Coke headquarters. And she was actually giving training to young students about how to like draft a mission statement. And I've posted like your personal statement. Like she was doing that. She was like mentoring young people. They have no, she's a listed co-conspirator for murder. And then I think there was like the Nala project. Like she does some nonprofit stuff. Probably takes a client here and there through friends that still talk to her. I don't know. I haven't asked. If you're listening, <laughs> um, you want to send me an email if Wendy's lights are on? They they have done that before, and I've answered real time. It's so funny. I'm just checking my email because I was checking that, you know, see if the person who has got eyes on uh, Wendy's bedroom sent me an email. But if you do send me an email, I'm looking at my email right now. So I went to go look at it. And someone just sent me a um, an email saying they're listening to this live right now. And um, uh, talking about my thing with the case, which I assume is the Wendy you know, interrogation, just that, you know, being like the catalyst for me, the inflection point. And they, they are telling me in an email what theirs is. So I thought that's really sweet. I'll read it in a little bit, but I'm going to give you a shout out. So anyway, before I sign off, when these lights are on and you're watching, I didn't announce this, so maybe not. I didn't give any kind of, um, this was a very impromptu live stream.
Jay, I want your energy to be my curse out my minute and critic. You are so great. Yeah, I have to give a shout out to Jay. So Jay's interviewing Yendra on Monday. Jay, do you know what time it is? Jay, I will send, I'll send, I'll promote the hell of that link and try to send it around beforehand. Um, I really like Yendra. I'm so excited to hear what she's going to say. But um, yeah, Jay, you're one of those people that, um, frankly, there's a lot of lawyers and even they might even like admit this group, but there's, there's a lot of lawyers that talk about this case that, you know, are maybe still actively learning through it. I guess this is a kind way for me to say, and that, you know, just because you have a law degree doesn't mean everything you have to say is always smart and insightful and right. Maybe objective, um, but I really do don't have, a, I'm not speaking about anyone in particular, no beef. Um, a lot of lawyers know that, talk about this case, know that I really like them and respect them. But um, Jay, really, I really appreciate the Jay's angle on this because like me, he can sometimes find the funny thing. He makes creative connections and um, I do that too. And so when I see, I can recognize in someone else and they're contributing the way they're doing. I, I really do appreciate it. Same with society page, society page makes those creative connections and it just makes it interesting. Why do you think there's so much interest in this case, right? Not to sound conceited, but I was the first one doing graphics back in 2020. People like wondering where this all grew out of. Like other, you know, podcasters are releasing the 2016 calls to funny, goofy graphics on Canva and cutouts. I mean, that's a kind of like a concept that, that's out there. And I, I get it. Maybe they don't know that they're doing it. Um, but it's a very specific content. 2016 wiretop Adelson calls. I don't even care if you post them in public documents, but to like to have the same concept to do like funny little like make jokes do funny like whoa you know it's just very specific it's been done it's a really small community even if you didn't know you can look back and you can know so anyway yeah it's like um like uh, making a true crime this like dark comedy um you find symbols and themes you know the pepto bottle you know diary of donna um you know TV alibi, like all the videos I did, you know, back in the day or the things, it's, you're making it interesting. There's really something to that. So um, as opposed to sort of just, the, you know, the dry facts, the run or, you know, the podcasters that go case to case and kind of read crib notes of, you know, publicly, you know, available information and the lawyers walk through the in and outs of what 50% could happen or not could happen. Um it's different to, to actually create content. Judy does it. Judy can create as a lawyer. She can go, she does both. Who else does both? Is it just Judy? Anyway. The NC dude said he helped police with a lucky gun. He gave the attitude of the crime. Yeah, I mean. He also said that he had a pirate after I called him out. He was taking, he said he was getting migraines and abuse and that he did a video, which was like his reaction video after I called him out and he turned off all his comments. And he said that like he had reported me to, um, he left a lot of comments where he was like challenging me. And I know I'm right. I mean, I paid the money to run the port. I know that's not Jeff. He was calling Jeff a wife abuser in New Zealand. You know, I can see how he thinks he found someone with the same name and that might be significant in New Zealand, but it was a wrong dude, clearly. And um, he was like telling a bunch of thousands of people in his videos that would click on it that Jeff was a wife abuser. He said it plainly. I have the screenshots um, several times. And then I just started attacking Rob as being involved and should be charged. Just like so irresponsible doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about and he's doing it and he's getting clicks and he's got his little minions that listen and think he's making a contrarian point and uh like look check jeff out he's a bad guy you know it's just it's really wild so anyway um he said that he was reported me and then he pulled up my page on a live stream and told everyone to like report me to youtube for bullying and um You know, everyone just thinks he's being unfairly attacked. I mean, I have, I have he's lying. I have the evidence. He's he never apologized that he got Jeff wrong. He did, and um, now he's just repurposing it and just you know playing everybody a sucker because everyone's clicking like he's got some like crazy content. I don't know. It just makes me just makes me sick. Um, 
But anyway, and he said that after that, he said that he had a pirate, like a legit pirate that was going to run his buy me a coffee account, to like send money. Um, and then a pirate that's like, he'd sent information, like make it sound like he was like sending information on me to track me down. It was threatening. So unfortunately, I'm, I mean, fortunately, I'm not really scared because I know he's full of shit and I know I'm in the right, but you know, kind of sh shitty that Robert and Jeff, and even I have to deal with it. You know, it's just unfair and it sucks that he's still thriving and getting, um, getting that he's at like over 5,000 subscribers. And when I attacked him, I think he had like two. It's just not right. Pretty soon I'll have more than me. That's just YouTube. So anyway, I'm going to go. I don't see any more questions. Oh, wait. Any new pics of Wendy? Where's she hanging out? Oh, she's lying low to Miami Beach. I do know she went, um, she spent the holidays at her uh, boyfriend's, with her boyfriend's family. I can tell you that I heard that. Hi, Mia. Do you know what was in the black plastic bag that was supposed to be retrieved by Lewis and Sigfredo from the storm? Um, th that wasn't, are you talking about how they went to, um, I think it was the Players Club Apartments or something, Ashford Club Apartments on Thomasville. And they went back in a ditch and so, a wide witness said that they saw someone come with um, the fit, the descriptions and it had you know, they came back and their like legs were wet or their pants were wet. Um, if that is what you're referring to, um, Monica Jordan, who I met and were, as a private investigator that worked with Tim Jansen, um, said on some live stream, I think I was there in Tallahassee and I was like sitting in the room when they were doing the live stream. So it's memorable to me, but, um, it was during the trial, but you know, she worked with Lewis, um, you know, on his plea and everything like that. So she, um, she said that that was that they looked into that private investigator, that little incident that was reported. It was just totally bogus. It didn't, it didn't pan out. It wasn't them. So according to Monica and Jordan, private investigator who worked very closely with Luis Rivera, that, that wasn't a real thing. Even though it was a tip somebody called in. No, he's not. And honestly, there was like it's a big period of, period of time there. I think maybe we've gotten past that a little bit with more trials. But I mean, I remember going back and forth with people in comments and just seeing people say things like, Harvey's just so weak. Don't think he knew about it. In fact, there's one person. I don't know if they're listening here. There's one person who comments on this case and a lawyer, a male lawyer. And when we started communicating, tried to tell me. Oh, the old man, he didn't know anything about it. Well, that did not sit right with me. I read him the riot act. You're so like, you know, it, we, it was friendly. But I was just like, that's such a stupid take for you to take that he was just like sitting in freaking a corner with like a TV tray fucking drooling. That's not Harvey. So, um, and you've been hurting those texts that were played in the, you know, or the texts or emails that were read by someone in the court from Charlie's iCloud by Georgia, which is like Donna was like talk texting Charlie and said, Oh, Wendy, Wendy was here. You know, and you won't believe what Dan was, you know, doing your dad's blood pressure went up so high. He had to leave the room. It was bad. And you heard him like almost like fist fighting that guy that Charlie falsely accused of sexual harassment, you know, like getting in his face. Like, oh, no one hurts. He's not, he's not. I don't know who, I think it's because Wendy went out and said he had brain cancer and that got repeated. I think he got like, that meant, put everyone in these like this feeble, like wallflower and he's truly not. But I do have told that he is, um, he's got the most conscious of anyone in that family. And that is the reason why more than one person has reported that he could not, Harvey's the one that couldn't look people in the eye. Tamara being one of them. The other, I won't say. It's very telling. So anyway, um, so anyway, the, this lawyer commenter on this case said Harvey didn't know and said, like, that's the one thing you got wrong. 
So anyway, that was like two years ago. So when the Metsuri tape came out and was finally released, it was clearly showed that Harvey and Charlie, you know, they were talking about this. Harry was, you know, wasn't upset, was aware. Did Katie know? All that kind of stuff. So that came up and I remember going, taking screenshots of that Metsuri and sent straight to that lawyer. And, um, and I was like, see, told you. And they're like, yep. So just, you know, even lawyers have bad takes. I know it also shock you. They have a lot of good takes, but just because you know the law doesn't necessarily mean that you're good at people. And sometimes it can be a detriment. Dangerous is the lawyer that can do people skills and, um, you know, reading people. Uh, do you think know the real reason Charlie moved? Any info on that? If you can share info, her maester. Yes, I can. Um, what I've heard is Charlie's been was um, threatened a couple times, and the first time when he moved um, out of Bacala, it was because of a, a threat, and. Um, I think it may be Latin Kings or maybe Charlie was told it was the Latin Kings, but you know, maybe the Latin Kings aren't very concerned with him. You know, I don't, I don't know how concerned. Um, I think there've been a couple little shakedowns where he's been physically given maybe, you know, that phrase that Charlie liked to say, this is how it's done. Which is like they give you a time frame to get them something. It's very short, very much, you know. Um, I think Charlie learned a couple times how it's really done in, in prison, and I'll leave it at that. And I think that the threat was real, so they moved him, and then he, it happened again at his in Columbia, and I think. It, it was so scary that Charlie checked himself into solitary because he didn't feel safe because there was a very specific threat. And a lot of people know that um, there's a lot of cameras in prisons, right? So um, possibly it got caught on camera and made a little bit more credibility. Um, and, but he, I do, I was told that he volunteered, he moved because of a threat and, um, I think it's been more than one. And if you go back and you watch that Carl's, um, Carl's video on like the, it's like a 12 minute video. I remember I watched it recently after, you know, it's kind of learning all of this. If you go back and you watch that, like the, the Adelson family lifelong extortion, um, where he was talking specifically, I remember Carl saying, what's going to happen is he's going to get in there and people in there may even fight amongst themselves. Who's going to get to, to get a go at Charlie. You know what I mean? It's like, you can't extort him. I'm, ex you know, so he's mine. He's, you know, I'm going to, so, um, so I think that, uh, threatened him. So I think that he's like, there might be infighting on who gets the real chunk out of him. So I think that if you go back and watch Carl's video about sort of the, lifelong extortion that someone like with a set of facts around them like Charlie has, I think that that probably will be your best guess at why Charlie is having trouble in prison. And with what I just said, read between the lines and that's that. All right. Well, everybody, I'm scrolling for last minute comments. I'm going to go down to the bottom. Oh, let me check, see if my lights person. No. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm in the wrong inbox. Um. Uh, no, this, I, I, I really just didn't give any advanced warning. I just decided 10 minutes before I, I wanted to do this, that I was in the mood to do it. So, um, probably not even watching, but, um, 
so nothing on that. Someone just asked me randomly somewhere else, you know, if I heard of anything about Charlie's son and, um, what I'll say about that is I think he's good, you know, and I want him to, I want the little guy to be good. I think that Bree's probably getting some good, a good break from all of this with not being able to talk to Charlie because of the situation. Um, I th I'm assuming she talks to other people in the family and I think, you know, she's getting some distance I and mean, she follows me and, you know, and we've had some back and forth and I'm sure that that's not welcome by the Adelsons. And, um, I think she's just a girl trying to figure it out. She's got a, a really good sense of humor and, you know, she, she can see that, and much like Ruth can, like I make jokes to Ruth and Ruth laughs and like, she can like, she's, I, you know, obviously I do it with tasteful, but she's, she can, she can set aside all of this and laugh at jokes and find humor. And, um, and Brie can too. Brie's actually funny, <laughs> you know? And um, I think with the right support and time. I mean, she can't, she can't undo the fact that she was like a 24, 25 year old, you know, and she had a, a baby with Charlie. She can't undo that. And I can say, because we went head to head fighting, you know, the very end stages, the last couple of days of this, the Charlie's trial. I mean, she was believing everything she was being told naturally. Right. Um, so just an eye opener, give her time. I'm not, I don't think she's ever going to, you know, go one way or do something drastic. But, um, and then also to June, you know, I went after June like really hard. I was so angry with her because I felt like she was covering for him and I was just really rooting for her. And, um, you know, I look back and I obviously regret that. And I've communicated with June and she's opened up to me on some stuff. Um, and some of it I could say here and I'd probably get a lot of clicks, but, um, you know, she just, she really loved the guy, you know, it was, you know, they had six months and he told her everything she wanted to hear and stuff that she probably never heard before and all the financial security. Um, I can, I can understand, I don't agree with it. And I, I don't know if June and I be friends in real life, but I can understand it. Um, yeah. And it's just really hard when she gets sucked into a narcissist, a narcissist web to get out. I was very, you know, I wish she would get, I felt like she didn't give consistent testimony, but I can say that she opened up to me a little bit and, you know, I, I really do wish her well. Who else? Anybody else that I'm fighting with that I need to make up with? I don't think so. But those two girls, yeah, I mean, the, you know, uh, all in all, I don't agree with all their life choices. I'm not going to throw my weight or put my credibility behind them for all their future church choices. But I, as right now, as like a human woman to woman, I, I do like them and I, I only want good th things for them despite, you know, despite it all. All right, guys, I'm going to go. Um, I'm really lost in the comments, so I'm trying to scroll fast, see if I can. Oh, God. Yeah, I guess I'll end on Dubin. Okay. There, I I should, it, question is, is Dubin going to be vetting down shores? Okay, it's so fun. I need to pull it up because it's like an evergreen green tweet. I'll probably go find it when I'm done. But um, I, th I think Rosh Brown was checking Twitter. Just something gives me that the feeling that he was, you know, obviously you want to see how the public's reacting during the trial. So anyway, um, I tweeted as soon as I learned about Josh Dubin and started seeing him running around, bringing all that New York, uh, big swinging dick energy into that courtroom. I knew how bad it was. And I saw his little weasel, uh, guy that was like working with him, stood up real straight with his laptop, like researching everybody. Um, I'm telling you, I've okay, I sat in that courtroom and I know Tallahassee and it's like sat at these people's dinner tables. One other thing that people may have missed the sidetrack is that um, a really sweet moment 
a lot of, well, I'll, a lot of cool moments happened in the trial, but um, when I was there, uh, me and Keith McClin, McClin, what was it, McClin, CIA guy, smoked me out and he seemed to know who I was. Um, you know, but there was one moment where um, Judge Hankinson, who is a very, you know, I went to high school with his daughter. We weren't close, but she was, a, she was like one of those really nice girls. You know, you could just tell she was just a really nice girl. Um, but um, anyway, I was talking with Ruth, pulled along the side of one of the corridors, and the the victim advocate, Hel Helene Potluck, walked up and said, you know, Ruth, I want you to meet somebody. And Ruth was kind of distracted with me. And she said, you know, this is Judge Hankinson's wife. And Judge Hankinson had just passed away and said, this is Judge Hankinson's wife. And, um, you know, and she turned around and she said, you know, I just wanted to come in and I wanted to show my support for you and your family. And she said, it's hard for me being back in the courtroom, but I wanted to come in and sit and show support for you. And I hope that your family gets, um, your family gets justice. And, you know, I just know my husband, you know, um, you know, want, all of us want that for you as well. And just, you know, just it was a very touching moment. Of course I turned to go, I knew my daughter, I said the name. So anyway, um, but that was just a very touching, but it's, it's very Tallahassee, right? It's very Tallahassee, it's a small town, it's warmness, it's, um, and so Dubin was all off. And so I saw him bopping around with that New York energy and I knew it was a bad move and, um, that it was going to be a turnoff for those jurors. And I actually even wrote a tweet and I want to go find it, but I, I tweeted and I was, I said, Roshbaum, um, you know, I want this to be a fair fight. You're making a critical error with this Josh Dubin. Him and his little team are freaking everybody out in the courtroom. And I had people in the courtroom text me like, this is, th they are freaks. They are really freaks. They're really, you can see that they're like their energy. It's like, it's a turnoff, you know, it's your first impression too. So anyway, I tried to tell Roshbaum how big of a, and I even said, you know, just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's effective or something like that. So I almost want to like take that. I feel like it's an evergreen green tweet because that shows how mature I am to warn my enemies of their grave errors from the start. Um, and I was right. But Josh Dubin, man, what an idiot. Not an idiot. So anyway, when Josh, you know, you heard how Charlie was talking, Josh fucking Dubin, he's going to save my life. He's the golden goose. He was their secret weapon, this Josh Dubin. Okay. And so anyway, he's got... I'm probably going to get shit for this, but I used to listen to Joe Rogan. Okay. Um, and I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole. I just, I like the long form. I like, you know, certain things I respect about it, but ultimately I do think he's a douchebag. So anyway, and I've seen him do stand up several times in person, particularly at the comedy store. And I just don't think he's that great of a stand up. So, and you've even heard uh, Dave Chappelle and they were like sitting around some, like some talking thing and, and Joe Rogan was there and they were talking about how Dave Chappelle said how another like really famous comedian said that Joe Rogan is like a comedian who like works so hard. He willed himself to be a, a stand-up comic. And the way he said it for me, it was like, he was saying Joe Rogan is just not a natural comic, but because he was so disciplined and worked so hard, he became a stand-up comic. That's what Chappelle said. Even said. So I think that always stuck out to me. So I remember that. So anyway, Joe Rogan, selling supplements, venison, meat products, all of that. Sort of the, anyway, so Joe Rogan um, had agreed apparently to bring, had Josh Dubin on several times. So that's a big podcast and all the dudes are like, Joe Rogan, Josh Dubin's on. That's so, you know, he's a big freaking deal. So anyway, um, someone told me like Joe Rogan had agreed to have, or I read in comments that Joe had agreed, agreed to have um, Josh on, or, Dubin on regularly so that um, they could talk about innocent project or, you know, the criminal justice system um, as if he's like this, like real do-gooder. Right. So, and the innocent project has done a lot of great work. So anyway, he goes on Joe Rogan and I remember even, like people were posting like Charlie's, you know, he's going on Joe Rogan. Like it's so big. He's so famous. You know, Dubin's on Rogan again. So he brings this guy named Sheldon Johnson. Okay. And even the way this guy's talking, the little clips I've watched, he keeps referring to, he's like, I got caught up on a case. And he's like, just talking so coldly about it. Like, it's a matter of fact. Like, it's not like I got caught in bad trouble. Like, I got caught. It was like all about like just beating the, I don't know. There's something about that that really triggered me. The way that he was like, 
I don't know. It, it, maybe even sociopathic vibes. You get that kind of like separation. So anyway, I didn't get a good vibe from him, but whatever. I didn't think about it that hard. So really like a week or two after that. And so, and Josh Dubin is sitting next to this guy on Joe Rogan, looking at the guy saying that the guy is like amazing, that he's a miracle. I think he called him a mirror, Sheldon, a miracle for, you know, um, getting out of uh, this unfair sentencing cloud that he had over his head. And he's, Josh Dubin even went on further to milk it and say, you know, and Sheldon was put away by a black judge. So it's just like a black on black, that awful, you know, harsh sentencing well, you know, looking back on it now, because a couple of weeks later, Sheldon actually went and sort of like killed his like his rival gang member, who I guess has also been out in New York City and like basically chopped up his buddy body and put his like head in a freezer and carried his and wore this like awful blonde wig and was carrying out like body like you see in the surveillance CCTV, where, like, you know, people are just killed somebody in like an apartment or hotel and they're carrying out like the suitcases and the bodies in the bag. So you got like all those shots. And so this is a guy that Josh even went on Joe Rogan and lauded as being like a hero. He's overcoming this unfair treatment, this guy. And so good that we have Sheldon back out on the streets and he's overcome this and this all is because of me. He's a miracle. He's treated so unfairly and by and sentenced by a black judge of all things. And you can see the disgust in Dubin's face, like, oh, that black on black fucking injustice. Well, maybe this guy was a sociopath and has been getting in trouble. And maybe the judge saw or heard testimony or saw something they couldn't get me, or I don't know. But maybe that judge was using his discretion within his authority to keep a really bad guy off the street so he can't just go chop up people a couple of weeks after being on Joe Rogan with Josh Dubin. Huge black eye for Josh Dubin. I said it somewhere after this, but it really... If you can't trust the judgment of Josh Dubin not to go on Joe Rogan and sit next to a guy and call him a miracle and how great it is that you helped him get out so he could go murder someone else, why the fuck should we pay a lot of money to Josh Dubin to pick a jury if his judgment is that shit? Huge black eye, instant loss of credibility, hilarious that I don't know how much money Charlie paid him, definitely probably six figures, I would think. I don't just to get someone of that prominence. It's like the rate goes up um, if you're on Rogan, I guess. But just it was just it's so laughable. It's such a horrible story. It's such a um, foot in the mouth for Josh Dubin, a uh, black judge sentence. Yeah, he kept him off the street. So you couldn't. And then you went out and went and all did that. And he went and murdered somebody. He was apparently pleading for his life. The neighbors heard him calling out through the walls. Of course, Sheldon killed him. But how he's got a family and, you know. You know, good going, Josh. Really interested to see how your career is. I'm sure you'll be back on Joe Rogan shortly. But anyway, that was Charlie's Josh fucking dude and Golden Goose. And literally a couple months, he's like a total disaster helping a murder murder again. Thanks, Josh Dubin. It actually is hilarious. They probably will do some sort of mini series because it's like it's such an extreme fuck up, right? Josh fucking Dubin. Great job. Josh is really on a winning streak between Charlie's trial. All right, I'm going to go. I'm tired. It's almost been two hours, and I haven't done these in a really long time. All right, bye, everybody. Happy Friday night. Have a great weekend. Bye.